you know, a lot of this uh, last uh, couple of weeks has been just so crazy. Uh, and it's been relentless. You know, at this point, we're looking at a long uh, duration for this um, sequestration. And it reminds me of uh, one time when I was a Boy Scout. And it was probably the biggest adventure I had as a Boy Scout. I was a high school student and I guess a middle school student. And I went on a 50 mile trek with my backpack in the Laurel Highlands of Pennsylvania. That's in the west, uh, near the Pittsburgh area, but it's very remote. There's a dense uh, forest uh, and it's on a mountain ridge. So you have to climb up these mountains and then you're on this rocky ridge at a higher elevation. And we went for days and days uh, living just off of what we carried in our backpacks, about a 25 pound backpack, carrying all of our food, carrying water filters uh, for the journey. And man, by the end of that 50 mile journey, we were all exhausted. Uh, our feet hurt, our backs hurt, our, 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 our legs hurt, our heads hurt. And we were just so hungry. We'd run out of food like we should have on that last day. Uh, we didn't want to filter any more uh, gross uh, water from the pump. Uh, so uh, we were so excited to finally reach the end of this journey. And we had just one more mountain to climb. So we climbed one more mountain up the trail. And at the top of the mountain was a big, big boulder that had a kind of observation platform where you could just see all the valley below. So we all clambered up and there was probably about uh, seven of us who were making the journey and six of us were up at the top and we started to take pictures with our little uh, uh, disposable cameras. We had picked with the little wheel that you would have to click because none of us had cell phones at that point that could take uh, pictures. And six of us were there and we took a picture holding up our hands to say, we did it 50 miles, we won, we've just achieved, we've come to the end of the road. And then we hear, help, crash. The seventh guy had just barely put his hand at the top of that boulder and then he lost his footing and fell into a little bit of a ravine created by that big rock. We scrambled down the rock and it turned out he had broken some bones and was in terrible pain. All of a sudden, the 50 mile journey, the marathon we had just been running, turned into a sprint. It didn't matter how much pain we were feeling, we had to run. This whole time we had just been slogging along, but now we were running as fast as we could down the rocky, muddy trail as quick as we could to find somebody with a phone that could call emergency personnel to make their treacherous way up the path to rescue our friend. It's a story of a marathon turning into a sprint that was called to mind uh, just two days ago when Allison was reading an article from the Boston Globe uh, in which an op-ed piece was written by seven infectious disease specialists from the Boston area, from seven different hospitals in the Boston area. And the headline of the article said, fighting the coronavirus is both a marathon and a sprint. It was a powerful article from our nation's specialists in infectious disease, giving us some real talk that uh, part of fighting this uh, global pandemic we find ourselves in is a sprint. It requires all of our adrenaline to run and move and adapt as quickly as possible to get people safe and to flatten the curve to protect as many people as possible from a public health standpoint. But after we've done that, it's not over. We don't solve the problem quickly. It's the marathon of enduring isolation and separation from our loved ones, of uh, having to make do with what we have rather than being able to go out like we normally can. And then understanding that when this marathon sprint uh, seems to be over, 
when we can finally return to our day-to-day, -day, that we will be different. The world will be different. And part of the marathon will be taking the lessons we've learned through this crisis into the next chapter. It's a lesson that uh, I think reminds me about our life of faith. Following God is both a marathon and a sprint. Think about your own life. I can think about mine and about people that I've seen, and I can tell you there is a time to sprint in your spiritual life. A short period of time when a Long distance is covered very quickly. I remember being a college kid and uh, sharing Christ with um, other classmates and seeing the light go on in their eyes when in an instant, maybe after years of struggling with faith and thinking about God, in a flash, in a hundred yard dash of faith, they go from not believing in Jesus to trusting him as savior. That's a sprint, a moment of faith that changes your life forever. And many of us can also speak to just the pavement pounding, pounding, the relentless repetition over and over again, the marathon of faith that we find ourselves in in our day to day. Knowing that sometimes, last week we learned about sometimes, uh, rather than removing danger, God is with us through the danger and learning to trust God in a long-term lifetime of faith. That's a marathon. That's the 26 miles in the sun that we uh, hear the Apostle Paul talk to us about. Run with perseverance as one who will finish the race, win the race. It's that image of faith being a marathon and a sprint that carries us, carries us into uh, today's scripture story. I'm going to read from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 through 12. The scene opens up on Elijah, who has just won his greatest victory for the Lord. God has carried him through natural disasters, public health crises of famine when uh, Elijah ran out of food, but God miraculously prepares uh, water and cakes for him to eat with the widow of Zarephath in, uh, the, uh, uh, in that crisis. He faces political uh, enemies, and his greatest accomplishment has just happened when he faces off against over 400 prophets of a pagan god and he beats them in a battle of prayer, in a battle of spiritual warfare where Elijah is able to call down fire uh, from, the, from the heavens, from Yahweh, the living God who we worship, and the prophets of Baal are not, and all the prophets of Baal are dispatched. This infuriates the queen of the northern kingdom of Israel, Jezebel. All those prophets belong to her, and now she is out for revenge, circling all her armies against Elijah. So we read from 1 Kings that now Ahab, the king of the north, told Jezebel, the queen, everything Elisha had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them whom you killed. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. Then he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. 
he looked around, and there, by his head, was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and then he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for this journey is too much for you. So he got up and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled forty days and forty nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper, a still, small voice. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We open with Elijah at the end of a long marathon, a 50-mile hike on a mountaintop. He's exhausted. He's come through the famine, come through political intrigues. He's done miracles. He's faced over 400 enemy prophets. But this is too much. The story opens up saying that Elijah was afraid. That Hebrew word afraid has two meanings. It means both to see and to be afraid. And that's a great word for Elijah, who's a prophet, who's supposed to see things other people can't see about the world. But I have to say, I really resonate with this, that sometimes to see is to fear. Uh, right now, all of us are connected to global media, to 24-hour news, to Twitter, to Facebook, to uh, online articles being posted all the time and shared. And I have to admit that there are days when I wake up and in this crisis, and rather than reading my Bible first thing when I turn on my phone, instead I turn on Twitter. I look at the CDC website and I look at the count for the coronavirus and I feel afraid. To see the danger sometimes is to be afraid of the danger. So that makes sense. And all of a sudden, Elijah's marathon turns into a sprint. The Hebrew says that he runs for his life to save his soul. It's the uh, same phrase that's used when Abraham is f fleeing Sodom and Gomorrah, when it's going up in a great big fireball. You're running as if your very life depends upon it. He's in danger of these enemy armies from Jezebel coming and killing him within this 24-hour uh, uh, deadline that Jezebel has given for the bounty on his head. But what's interesting is just how far he runs. He could have just run a little bit further to the south, to the uh, kingdom of Judah in the south, where a good king who worshipped Yahweh, Je King Jehoshaphat, was sitting on the throne with the mighty walls of Jerusalem on Mount Zion in the royal city of the southern kingdom. But it's not even mentioned in the hundred yard dash that Elijah is doing. The next stop 
from the northern kingdom of Israel that's mentioned in his journey is Beersheba, which is at the extreme southern tip. That's the Mobile, Alabama of the southern kingdom. He's run straight through the safe zone, the civilized zone, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. The only thing in front of him now is the wilderness. The Sinai Desert, where God's people wandered for 40 days and 40 years in circles. And at this point, he leaves his servant behind. He throws his hands up and says, I can't run another marathon. I'm exhausted from the last marathon. I'm exhausted from the sprint. I'm done. I've been following God all this time, but I'm no better than my ancestors who all died. Moses died in this desert. I'm no better than him. This is enough. I'm going to lay down under this bush and die. And there, at his lowest moment, is when God comes to him. That's like the sermon we preached uh, and heard last week about God being with us. Not just a God up in the sky who's distant from us. Not just a God who uh, wants to solve our problems but detect himself so he comes to us in the middle of a pandemic in a hermetically sealed hazmat suit. A God instead who comes to us in the flesh. There are many ancient commentators who think that the angel of the Lord, the messenger of God who appears next in our story, is actually the second person of the Trinity. It's Jesus, the physical manifestation of God, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the eternal word who takes on flesh and comes and touches us at our lowest moment when we feel the most alone, the most isolated, the most hopeless about the future, it's then that Jesus comes and says, get up and eat. And there in front of Elijah is a reminder, almost like a hug from God, a hug from Jesus. It's the same meal that sustained him in the famine when he was about to die, when he was one meal away from starvation. And God miraculously prepared bread and water to feed him and a widow. Once again, Elijah wakes up and Jesus has cooked him a meal. But he's so tired, it's not enough. He has to go back to sleep. Once again, the angel of the Lord wakes Elijah up and says, You're not ready yet. You're not strong enough for the journey. But I will make you ready. And so he eats again of the miraculous bread and water of the living God. And now he is ready. And he begins a marathon of faith. A short distance that he could have traveled in a week or two. He takes 40 days and 40 nights, walking circles in the desert, retracing the 40 years that the Israelites spent following Moses. At this point, his journey is not just a journey out of danger. It's a journey into God, into the presence of Yahweh. And at last he arrives at the beginning, almost like he's traveled back in time to where it all started, where the name of our church, Covenant Presbyterian, comes from. The location of God's sacred covenant, his everlasting promise with his people, the promise that we can take hold of right now, that I will be your God, Yahweh says, and you will be my people. A promise given on Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. It's two names for the same location, the same holy mountain. The same mountain where Moses, when he was convicted as a murderer and was 
on the lamb from the law and was just a day laborer, a blue collar worker, he sees a burning bush on this same mountain and he is transformed in the presence of the living God from a criminal into the greatest prophet of the Hebrew people. It's the same place where God gives the law on top of Mount Sinai to Moses and the people are transformed by the Bible, by the living word of God that doesn't leave us the way we are, but transforms us for his service. It's the same place where we receive God's sacred covenant, that he will always be with us. It's here that Elijah climbs up the end of that marathon of faith, miles and miles through the desert. And there he goes into the same place where Moses encountered God. He goes into a cave. The ultimate quarantine. Separated from civilization, separated even from view. And it's there that he hears God's voice saying, I will appear to you. Even here in your isolation, I am about to pass by. But God wasn't in the mighty wind. God wasn't in the earthquake. God wasn't in the fire. God was in the still, small voice. God isn't in the chaos. God is in the quiet. That's good news for us today, wherever you are. Whatever struggle that you're facing today, it could be a financial struggle, it could be a relational struggle, it could be a health struggle that you're facing as we're all adjusting to this pandemic. But just know that in the middle of all the noise, all the confusion, all the real danger, that God is not in your chaos. God is in the quiet. You have access to him, and he wants to pass by your cave, wherever you are right now. It's interesting to look at these three situations, the wind, the earthquake, and the fire, because these are the three ways that God appeared to Moses in the past. God appears to Moses on this same mountain, Mount Sinai, in the burning bush, in the fire. God appears to Moses in a mighty wind that blows all night on Passover. As the Israelites are escaping slavery in Egypt, they face the Red Sea, and it looks like there's no way, and then God makes a way by blowing a mighty wind that rushes and pulls the waters back and lets the Israelites cross into salvation history, into safety from danger, onto dry land. And then there are the lyrics from one of the oldest hymns in the Bible, the Song of Deborah and the Book of Judges. And she says that God appeared to the people of Israel as they wandered through the desert those 40 years, when his footsteps through the wilderness were the sound of earthquakes. And yet, God does not appear to Elijah in these old ways, in these chaotic ways, God appears to Elijah in a new way, in a way that Elijah could not have expected. Elijah calls upon the name of the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty, whose power can match the armies of Jezebel. And yet God is not in that overwhelming power. Instead, God appears as a still, small voice to speak to Elijah right to his heart in the way that he most needs. And he says to Elijah, there are things that you haven't seen. You have seen the danger and you fear that Hebrew word ra'ah that has two meanings. But I am doing things right now in the middle of your crisis that you haven't seen, that you won't know until they unfold. You are not just being pressed by your circumstances. You are being prepared by the Holy Spirit 
for your next chapter. God says, the people of Israel haven't deserted me. I've prepared 7,000 people who are still faithful. You're not alone. I've already anointed two good kings of two different countries and a successor for you, a good pastor who will shepherd the people. I am preparing new transformative things that you're not aware of, that you're going to see once the crisis is over. And last of all, you don't need to fear death, Elijah. You just need to follow me. It turns out that Elijah is the only character in the whole Hebrew Bible who doesn't die. Maybe Enoch as well. But Elijah's end is not what he sees and fears. He goes out, he anoints these kings, he anoints his successor Elisha, and then a chariot of fire comes down and takes Elijah away before he can die. Elijah could not picture the transformation that God had in store for him and that God had in store for the world. But the word that God speaks to him at last is, get up, turn around, and retrace your steps. It's another double meaning word, that word turn in Hebrew. It's the word shuv. It means both to turn around in your journey, to make a U-turn, but it also means to be transformed, to repent from your ways, the old ways, and to receive God's new transformation for you. Wherever you are right now, I know you're facing a struggle. I'm facing struggles. We're all facing a crisis as a global community right now. But God has a transformation for your life right now. And it's something that you've never seen before. I want to close the sermon by challenging you to take time every day to still the chaos and to listen to the quiet, to listen for God's still small voice in your life to receive his transforming love.